Two arguments for starting impeachment proceedings against President Trump are first, that impeachment would bring into the open uh, uh, information withheld by the administration, and second, that it is the duty of Congress to protect the Constitution. There seems to be a concern, however, that the move could backfire politically. What is your stance on starting impeachment proceedings against President Trump and why? Chris, thank you for the question. We should begin impeachment proceedings against Donald Trump. Not something... <laughs> not something that I take lightly. Uh, it's it's an, an incredibly serious, sober decision that we should make as a country. Really, the last resort when every other option has failed us. And at this point, where the president has refuse to respond to any subpoena, where his attorney general will not testify, where he will not furnish other witnesses so that we can find out what happened to this great democracy in 2016 and how we prevent future attacks in 2020 and beyond. A president who invited the involvement of a foreign power in this democracy in 2016 and then did everything in his power to obstruct the investigation into what has happened. If we do nothing because we are afraid of the polls, or the politics, or the repercussions in the next election, then we will have set a precedent for this country that, in fact, some people, because of the position of power and public trust that they hold, are above the law. And if this great democracy, 243 years into this idea and this experiment, is to survive for another 243, or even another year or two, we cannot allow that precedent to stand. There must be consequences, accountability, and justice. The only way to ensure that is to begin impeachment proceedings. Chris, thank you for asking the question. So yep. just to follow up on that, you said that impeachment proceedings should start now. Nancy Pelosi, the House Speaker, says that the president, uh, impeaching the president would be very divisive in the country and would only help the president solidify his base. Do you think there's something to that? I do. You know, I, I understand the, the political implications of this, but I think this moment uh, calls for us to, to look beyond the politics and the polling and, and even the next election. It's, it's the very sanctity of the ballot box and the very future of the world's greatest democracy. And if this is important to us, and I think it is, then we need to look past those short-term consequences to the consequences to the future of this country. And the only way that we're going to get the documents and the facts and the truth to be able to pursue them as far as they go, as high up as they reach, is to compel the testimony, the furnishing of those documents through impeachment proceedings. It's the only way that we're gonna to get to the facts necessary to have that accountability and justice. Because short-term pain could be for you if you were the Democratic nominee, that's okay? That's possible, but, but listen, um, the, the consequence of the alternative is to turn a blind eye to this, okay. and in doing so, turn our back on the future of this country, and I cannot be part of that. We're, we're gonna have to make the tough decisions now. Okay, let's get to the audience again. Doug Thompson is a corn and soybean farmer who previously worked at the Department of Agriculture during the Clinton administration. Doug? Congressman, welcome to Iowa. Thank you. China and the Trump administration are in the midst of a protracted trade war. Theft of intellectual property and forced transfer of technology are at the core. I am a farmer. I have been asked to be a patriot and cheer for the home team, all while 40 years of market development in China is destroyed. The trade war has handed my soybean market to Brazil and to Argentina. My question, where are our allies, the EU, Japan, Australia, Canada, Mexico? Do we need to do this unilaterally? Thank you, Doug. May I ask you a question? Sure. How long sure. have you been farming? Uh, since 1976. And is, uh, are, are there children to whom you'd want to pass this farm on to a, a next generation? My son, Adam, is sitting right over there. Adam, good to see you. Yeah. He, he knew that he didn't want me to ad lib tonight. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I'm glad, yeah, <laughs> I'm, glad, I'm glad that you are, are both here, and I'm grateful Thank for you. the question. Um, you said it better than I could. You, you are bearing the brunt of this president's disastrous trade war and the tariffs that he's imposed. 
that are destroying the markets that you've worked a lifetime to establish you and other farmers and growers here and in my home state of Texas and frankly uh, across this country. I was talking to your former governor and the former secretary of, of agriculture, Tom Vilsack, and I was asking him, what do we do in this situation? And he responded with a rhetorical question. He said, when in the history of this country have we ever gone to war, uh, a military fight or a trade war without allies? Because that's exactly what we are doing now with China. Yes, they have manipulated their currency. Yes, they have dumped onto this market at below cost. And yes, there should be a consequence and accountability for that. But going this alone unilaterally has obviously not produced that. And your ability to pass that farm on to the next generation, when what you're growing cannot find markets around the world, when some of these fields, especially on the western part of the state up against the Missouri, are literally lakes right now, we've seen the bins that have blown open from the soybeans that were stored because they could not find a market that had soaked up all of that water and now spoiled and not covered by insurance. We need to have a response to this. We need to, we need to ensure that you can pass this farm on to the next generation. A couple of ideas. Let's bring our allies with us to the table, our traditional trading partners like Mexico, Canada, the European Union, into this fight to make sure that we get the results that we're looking for. Let's help farmers out today. Let's make sure that crop insurance covers stored grain. And then let's put you in the driver's seat for policy going forward. What are the best practices to grow corn and soybeans here? How can we keep more land under conservation? How do we pay farmers? And I've heard this expressed as pennies per meal for doing environmental services by leaving land in conservation or planting cover crops to pull more carbon out of the air, inject more of it in the soil, disturb less of it while it is there. I want you to take the lead in our administration on agricultural policy, and I want to win this fight with China, but I want to do it with allies, not alone. Thank you for asking the question. Appreciate it, Doug. So on that note, do you support the president's do you support the president's USMCA agreement to replace NAFTA? He, he might be headed in, in the right direction on this, but, but there's a lot more that we need to do. We need to make sure that the US worker is on a level playing field with everyone else against whom we compete. Let me give you an example. Many of the jobs that used to call my hometown of El Paso home crossed the river when the North uh, American Free Trade Agreement was signed. They're now in Ciudad Juarez where people are making 40 or $50 a week doing what American workers had done before. Part of the reason is there are no real labor unions or ability to organize or use the leverage of the value that they provide in those maquilas to demand better wages and working conditions and benefits that are good for those Mexican workers and then also make the worker here in the United States be able to compete on a more level playing field. So I want to make sure that in a revised MCA that I would love to be able to negotiate, that we ensure that that U.S. worker is on a more level playing field with any country with whom we have a trade agreement. I would also add stronger environmental protections and stronger human rights protections. If we do that, we will have fair trade to the United States. Thank you. Let's get back to the audience. Olivia Welter is a pharmacy student right here at Drake University and a supporter of Elizabeth Warren. Olivia. Yes, good evening. Hey, Welcome to Drake. Thank you for having me. My question for you is that recently, several states have introduced and passed bills that legally prohibit those with uteruses from exercising their reproductive rights. What specific actions will you take to allow us to gain back our right to our own bodies? Thank you. For so long, Women have been leading this fight, shouldering the burden of making sure that their reproductive rights are protected. It's time that all of us join them in this fight. As president, I will make sure that every nominee... <laughs> ..to every federal bench, including the Supreme Court, understands and believes that the 1973 decision, Roe versus Wade, is the settled law of the land. As, as president, I'll make sure that we do away with the gag rule, 
which prevents providers from referring women to get the best reproductive health care that they can. We'll do away with the Hyde Amendment. So that ensures that regardless of your income or your zip code, you're able to access a safe, legal abortion. And also the other services that are provided in family planning clinics, a cervical cancer screening, family planning help. In a state like mine in Texas where we have not expanded Medicaid, or one like yours where you privatize Medicaid to disastrous results, being able to get the health care that will keep women alive in the midst of a maternal mortality crisis that is three times as deadly for women of color. And then I will work with our partners in Congress to make sure that by statute, we prevent states from taking away the right that every woman should enjoy, making her own decisions about her own body and having access to the health care that makes that possible. Thank you for asking.